Good evening. We welcome you to our evening service here at First Baptist Church Waterloo. Glad that you could join us here in the building and welcome to those joining us online as well. Uh, as we uh, prepare for this evening service, let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you granted to us, for the sunshine, for the warmth. Lord, we know the days are coming when it is going to get colder again, and, and we are going to look back with longing on days like this. So we, we want to say thank you, Father, for giving us this time and the ability to enjoy your creation and to give you praise for it. Lord, as we gather tonight, we want to pray for our church family, and Lord, especially we think of those who have lost loved ones this week. We pray for the, the McCordick family. And we rejoice with them in the home going of, of Betsy. And we pray that uh, as the family rallies around one another in these days, that you would be their strength and comfort. We pray for the Archer family and the same thing, Father, that as Jim has gone home, we pray that you would uh, surround his family with your love. And, and Lord, that the great truth that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord would be a great comfort to them in these hours. Father, as we've just been uh, heard tonight, we want to remember Jim Burkholder, and, and Father, we hear that he has been moved to Freeport Hospital uh, for rehabilitation, and, and Lord, we know this could be a long process, but we ask that you would be with he, with he and his family, or with him and his family, Father, and that you would uh, speed his recovery. Father, we would, uh, we would just be uh, in praise and awe if you would raise him up and, and bring him back into our fellowship once again. Father, we, we know there are many others. We have uh, three or four families uh, struck with COVID this week, and, and we pray your grace to surround them in these, these hours of illness. And, and Lord, I know there are people here tonight who have come with burdens uh, that I do not know, Father, but I praise you that you do. And I ask, Lord, that you would meet their needs in this service tonight. Lord, we thank you that though we are human beings and we cannot see the deepest need of a person's heart, that, Father, you already know it. You have already planned this service and what will happen in it to meet that need. And, Father, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit you would accomplish your purpose. Father, we pray that you would be with all of our missionary family and we ask your blessing on them. We pray for those who have been in summer work and are now uh, home with us and going on to the next stage of their ministries or of their lives. And we ask for direction on their behalf, Father, that they might uh, continue to follow you and, Lord, that you might continue to lead them each step of the way. And now, Father, for this evening's service, we ask you be with us. You would uh, be with each one who has a part. And, Lord, may the end result be that all the glory and praise goes to you alone. For we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. So again, with fall coming up, we do have a lot of announcements, and the theme for most of them is going to be you need to register, okay? <laughs> so grab a bulletin and just know that everything in there you need to register for. And then you'll be taken care of. Um, if you need a picture for the photo directory, we will be taking more photos after the evening service. If you need one, you can come talk to Bethany and I in the foyer. And if you'd rather have a professional photo from a professional photographer, you can submit that by August 31st. And you can do that to the info at FPC Waterloo email address. Next Sunday during the Sunday school hour in the gym, there will be an abuse policy meeting taking place. We know that's a long weekend and a lot of people will be away, but we are still going to have it. That way we can kind of get most people prepped for the fall. And that is mandatory for all that are gonna be working with children or wherever throughout the church. So please attend if you are able. Again, September 11th, there's a lot going on September 11th. There is the baptism service, there is promotional Sunday, but one thing that you need to be reminded of is that it is the fall kickoff barbecue and you need to register. So you can do that online, and please remember to either bring a salad and a dessert to share. Um, yeah, so make sure that you register for that. Adults, new Sunday school format, you also need to register for that. There's been a lot coming in, but I'm sure there are still more, so please go and register online. And for those that uh, had questions, there will be a Zoom option available. If you're going to join us by Zoom, you don't really need to register, because there's only going to be one class available on Zoom a quarter just for 
ease. Uh, what else is there? Lots of Bible studies, ladies' Bible studies. There's Monday and Wednesday. The Monday's in, on Zoom, Wednesday's in person. They're going through 1 Thessalonians. And if you'd like to register, ladies, you can talk to Judy Wodge or Jen. And then there is a ladies' precept Bible study that's on Zoom. That's starting September 17th at 9 a.m. And there are books that you can order. And if you would like to do so, you can talk to Jen or Pat Kruska. Men, there is also the Daniel study is picking up and they'll be starting, uh, resuming the Daniel chapter 7 through 12. And if you would like to get information or register for that, you can go on the church website and order the book. And there's lots of information there. Keep in mind, we have another Zoom discovery class beginning on September 20th. And if you know anybody that could benefit from a class, please refer them to Pastor Andy. And that way uh, they can get plugged in there. And then lastly, the Friends of Israel Conference, we're looking forward to that, October 13th through 15th. You need to register, and you can do so online, or there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. Uh, you can just put your name down. And if you are also interested, that we are looking for volunteers for various positions there. Again, take your bulletin, check the church website. There's a lot happening very quickly, and you don't want to miss out on anything. This time, I'm going to invite our worship team to come and lead us in singing. Well, you'll be happy to know that you don't have to register to sing with us tonight. If you're in the building, you can just sing, and that'll be a wonderful thing. We're going to do a couple of hymns to begin with here, and I'm going to read a scripture verse. Philippians 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. And what's uh, really important about that, I've been reading a book and, uh, on that recently, is, and this author said, it depends on what, your, what causes you to rejoice. And one of the things that we need to get into our lives so we can rejoice properly is that God is sovereign. Rejoice the Lord is King, we're going to sing here. Uh, so if you'll stand together, let's sing Rejoice the Lord is King, and then we're going to sing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, which focuses on the sovereignty of God, and we can rejoice in all of those things. Get those voices out, and here we go. Rejoice the Lord is King. Your Lord and King adore, who are told to give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Let's sing a little bit more about our God, immortal, invisible, God only wise. Thy great name we praise. 
at uh, John chapter 6, and just for context here, verse 25 through 27. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Let's just pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your wonderful Son, Jesus. It's him who gives us eternal life when we put our faith and trust in him alone. He is the gospel. He is eternal life. And we thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful salvation we can know in your dear Son. Lord, we thank you for the word. We just ask that you would please, Holy Spirit, uh, empower our dear pastor, give him the strength he needs from you, the power he needs from you to minister your precious truth to us tonight. Please open our hearts that we may receive it, and Holy Spirit, help us to apply what you want us to apply to our lives from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. more songs we'll like to remain seated i guess to sing this one that would be good and then we'll for the next one we'll stand i was just going to mention to the folks here uh, if you didn't make it to the wedding this is a little bit of the attire that you saw the father of the grandfather of the bride and the father of the bride we were in our actual uniform uh, we didn't want to bring the dress along because we wouldn't have done it any justice but uh it was a wonderful day, and uh, glad for those of the folks that did come up and encourage. But we're going to sing a song here. Remain seated as we sing, Worthy is the Lamb. There's all kinds of songs to pick on this, but I'm sure you'll recognize this one. There's some low ver- uh, lowness in here, so if you got a low voice, jump in with this. Thank you for the cross, Lord. For the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hand. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know. Your forgiveness and embrace Worthy is the Lamb Seated on the throne The crown Him now with many crowns You reign victorious
for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and grace. Worthy is the Lamb. scriptures through some of John's study already through Isaiah he is a worthy lamb who was slain well here's a verse for us a couple of verses actually Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2a as the deer pants for the water brook so my soul longs after you O God my soul thirsts for God for the living God I read that sometimes glibly <laughs> I don't always thirst that deeply as I'm sure many of us don't and I should it's a great verse to reminder uh, we can surface live for Christ or we can start digging down and uh, I trust that uh, as we sing tonight if we're going to stand here and reflect on these verses that it'll inspire us to dig a little deeper and thirst a little more this week especially as the pastor relates the word with us tonight as the deer panteth for the water so my soul longeth out you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you alone may my spirit you are my brother even though you are a king I love you more than any other so much more than anything you alone are my strength my shield to you Spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than any or silver, only you can satisfy. seated. Kevin and Sylvia, we appreciate that. Uh, I wore my wedding outfit this morning. If I had known I, I would have that we were doing that this evening, I might have, have kept it on. But 
Uh, anyway, uh, they tell me that today is your 51st wedding anniversary, John. And Trisha, congratula Trish, congratulations. Uh, it always shows the difference in experience, right? For John, it has been 50 years of wonderfulness and bliss. For Trish, it has been 51 long, hard years. And if you think I'm being mean to him, I say the same thing about my wife. And yes, for her, it has been 38 long, hard years. A um, couple of things about announcements. No, no, everything you said was good. I just want... Matt, Pastor Matt is the young guy around here. And he is... Um, he's nice. He's just plain nice. Let's, let's put it that way. And he said, if you would like... Drop by, get your picture taken tonight. Uh, no, if you have not sent in a picture and you're here this evening, take the whole 30 seconds it will take and go and get your picture taken. I know some of you, some of you are like family members of mine and it's like, oh, I hate having my picture taken. I don't want my picture taken. It's not for you. It's for me. Okay? I am embarrassed that I have been your pastor for almost two and a half years now, and I still don't know some of your names. Now, I have an excuse. It was called COVID and masks and, and all of the rest, but now it's gotten to the stage it's just embarrassing. All right? So this photo directory is to help us all, because I know I'm not the only one. There are some of you who have been here for decades and you're looking across the church at that person in the pew, and you're going, are they new, or should I know them already? And you don't want to do the classic Baptist thing of going up and saying, hi, are you new here? Well, no, actually, I've been coming for 15 years. Okay? So to avoid all of that, if we all have our, our picture taken then we will learn each other's names and get to know each other better. So it is not a choice this evening. If you have not turned in a picture, please take, it'll, it'll take a whole five minutes to take 20 or 30 pictures, and it'll help us all out to know each other better. All right? Secondly, September 11th. That's going to be a great Sunday. We're going to have a great time of fellowship together. And, you know, it's the first time we've been able to do this barbecue since COVID started. It's, so it means it's the first time we get to do this since I've been your pastor. All right? So I planned out all of my preaching schedule, and I got through all of this. And the, within the last week, I found out that, no, I'm not preaching on September 11th in the evening. Because there is no service on September 11th in the evening because we're sticking around for the barbecue. All right? So in case you didn't know, all of that Sunday will happen in the morning. Promotional Sunday in Sunday school will meet here. And then the regular service with a baptism here in, in this baptism and communion. And then we will be uh, going for a barbecue afterwards. So bring your dessert and your salad uh, to share with, with others as you please. All right? So uh, um, thank goodness for cut and paste. That's all I can say. For those of you who aren't computer whizzes, the, it used to be in the old days, if you messed something up, you had to retype the whole thing. Well, now I can just go, oh, I'm not preaching on September 11th. Let's cut them all and drop them down a week. And uh, that's what we will do. All right. So thank you for that. Thank you in advance for getting your picture taken and for having a picture in the directory so that we can all get to know each other. All right. Do you, re do you follow the news? Uh, do you read what's going on in the world? We are in the middle right now of the chapter that is the chapter of the feeding of the 5,000. It is just like the chapter before it in that the chapter starts with a miracle and then has two sections that address the fallout, if you will, from the miracle that Jesus performs. Well, this week, south of the border, there was a uh, meme that went around 
uh, that addressed the feeding of the 5,000. Did you see it? No? Okay, people are saying no. Um, it was done by some coach from some team I have no clue about, uh, but, but he did the meme that was how the mean right-wing people who say they love Jesus are miserable to the President of the United States because he is going to forgive student debt. And the meme went on to say, how can people who follow the man who fed the 5,000 complain about a president who is paying off student debt for so many people. Okay? So, G so President Biden is Jesus, and forgiving student debt is feeding the 5,000. Well, I would I'd make several observations. <laughs> Number one is Jesus only cost the crowd five loaves and two fishes, not $500 trillion. And I'm going to assume that since Jesus multiplied the bread and the loaves, that the little boy who donated his bread and his loaves, or his lo bread and his fishes, that he was full at the end of the meal as well. Quite honestly, if, if what happened in the United States was mimicked in the, the work of Jesus, he would have taken the little boy's uh, bread and his fishes, and he would have gone and fed the Pharisees in Jerusalem, not the 5,000 who were stranded in the desert with him. Uh, how bizarre uh, to draw that analogy. And in fact, and this is, this is where I feel God sends these things for me, folks. You know, it's like, I'm looking for an opening illustration for my sermon tonight, and my opening illustration is that Jesus condemns, in this story of the 5,000, the very thing that the crowds who support the president on this are all about. Okay? So... Let's see if you can, we can follow that through with the narrative. We're going to go uh, from the beginning of the, the response of Jesus to the crowd up to verse 40 tonight. And then we'll, next Sunday night, we'll pick up bread of heaven number two. Okay? So tonight we want to look at the first interaction. We finished last time with Jesus does the miracle. He goes up on the mountain. The, the, the disciples get in the boat. They start out. There's a terrible storm on the sea. And Jesus, in the middle of the night, comes walking on the water. And on top of the miracle of the 5,000, Jesus performs several other miracles. Peter, uh, this is the occasion, although it's not mentioned in John's gospel, this is the occasion that Peter gets out of the boat and briefly walks on the water towards Jesus. This is the place where when Jesus gets into the boat, the storm calms. And this is the place where immediately when Jesus gets into the boat, they are in Capernaum, their destination. So, Jesus is performing miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And now we are on the day after. The day after the feeding of the 5,000. And the crowd is going wild. It says on the next day, verse 22, on the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. And that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. Now Capernaum is on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. This miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 happened on the east side. Of, of the Sea of Galilee. And they were out in the wilderness. There's, there are, were no cities on that side of, of the Sea of Galilee because immediately when you get on that uh, eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the land rises up to the Golan Heights. 
on that eastern side. So there would have been some isolated farmsteads and the like, but there are no villages, no towns. And they're puzzled because there was only one boat and they saw Jesus' disciples row away in it and Jesus wasn't with them. But now they've woken up the next morning and there's no Jesus. Where has Jesus gone? If Jesus had walked away, they would have seen him because they were out to make him king after he had done the miracle of feeding the 5,000. So where has Jesus gone? The boat is gone, the disciples are gone, and Jesus is gone. Well, probably somebody overheard when Jesus was talking to his disciples that he tells them to go to Capernaum. So the crowd says, all right, let's go to Capernaum. Now, you know, liberal scholars, they come up with the silliest things. They say, where did all the boats come from? That all of this crowd got in the boats and got a taxi service to Capernaum. And it's like, number one, Sorry, number one, who cares? Um, it says there are boats. It didn't say that Jesus miraculously made boats. They, they were just local boats. And there was a storm the night before. Do you think that maybe some of the boats that had been out on the Sea of Galilee had maybe gotten in close to shore to avoid the storm and, and possible shipwreck in the middle of the lake? And... Anyway, the long and short, where is Jesus? Let's go find him. And they get in the boats, they cross over, and they get to Capernaum. When they found him, verse 25, on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, is that for the first question you would ask? What question would you have asked? Come on, I've just gone through the whole setup of the story. One boat, disciples in the boat, Jesus not in the boat, but Jesus not on the side of the sea that they're on. What would you have asked? How? How did you get here? How did you walk through us in the middle of the night or, and, and us, nobody see you? How, did you? how did you even walk around the whole sea? in the middle of the night. How did you get here? They don't ask that. They said, when did you get here? And Jesus immediately challenges them. This is one of those occasions. You know, when, when somebody comes and, and they, they come and they say something to get this conversation going, and, and Jesus sort of just cuts through all of the mustard and goes straight to the heart of the matter. And he says, I know why you're here. You're here today because I fed you yesterday. And you want me to feed you again. Isn't that the essence of what, what Jesus says to them? He says, uh, let's pick it right out of the, the passage. Jesus said, truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And he immediately challenges them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. He sees right through the point of the crowd. They are not there because of his message. Remember, before he fed the 5,000, he was preaching to the 5,000. He was giving them the message that he had come to bring. Well, what? what if you summed Jesus' message up, what, what was it? It, it? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. That's what John the Baptist preached. And when Jesus began his ministry, that's what Jesus preached. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. Spiritually prepare your hearts because God's promise of Messiah is here. And he comes to these people. He says, you're, you're after the wrong things. You are looking for a Messiah to fill your bellies. When I am here to do something spiritual. And Jesus, like he does in so many passages of scripture, tells the people that they are not to focus their lives on the stuff that is limited to here and now. 
They are to focus their, their lives on what is to come in God. Isn't that right? <laughs> when, when Satan tempts Jesus and he says, hey, you're hungry. 40 days you've been fasting. I know the power you have. Speak to these stones that they be made into bread. What's Jesus' answer? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Quotes Old Testament scripture. Uh, he tells a number of gospels. Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth where the moth and the rust corrupts, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where there is no thief and there's no moth and there's no rust. Now, is, is Christ unconcerned about the physical needs of our lives? No. Matthew chapter 6, right? Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are all those things that will be added unto you? Well, the passage immediately before, he talks about, look at the, the flowers of the field. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as beautifully as the, these. If your Father in heaven takes care of, of the grass that is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more will he take care of his children? It's not that, that Jesus says, listen, you, you need to be a monk and you go to starve yourself. And uh, what was it? Uh, I just reading this week, Simon Stellates. Uh, fascinating individual. He was in Egypt. He sat on the top of a pole for 40 years to, to get close to God. And I don't think he meant that physically closer because he was on a pole, but to avoid the world. It's like, no, no, Jesus, Jesus, is, not, Jesus is not saying, listen, needing food is bad. He is not saying needing a place to shelter is bad. He is not saying needing clothing to wear is bad. But he's saying, what's your priority? What are you aimed at? What is your target? We live in a world, right? Where we have a lot of people. We talked about it this morning. What, what is it that's their hope? For some people, we didn't talk about it this morning, but some people, it's their bank account, right? <laughs> Can I make a little confession to you tonight? Okay. You know, I'm 59 now. Somebody said, don't, this morning, Joanne told me, don't tell you. Some of us are a lot older. Yeah, you know what? I, I'm, I've got savings for my retirement. And the stock market's been taking a beating. Right? And you sort of go, Lord, is there going to be enough? And some of you are going, yeah, pastor, because you're never retiring. <laughs> Um, is there enough? But if that's our if that's all we're living for, that's not enough, right? That isn't sufficient. You know, Jesus himself said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Priorities. Priorities. That the priority is the saving, salvation of our soul, first and foremost. And all of these things, Jesus says, will be added unto you because the Father loves his children. Jesus says to them, hey, listen, you want to make me king. Your priority, though, is not that I am the Messiah, that I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. Your priority is that I am a never-ending source of bread. Think about it. Imagine if our prime minister was able every day to take five loaves and two fishes and multiply it to feed 20,000 people. Think a few of the food bank issues might be resolved in Canada if we had a, a prime minister who could do that. But what, what good is it? Yeah, I'm going to go for it. Murray, this is your fault. All your No, I'm teasing. Um, missions. What is missions? Missions is not going to Africa and digging a well. 
unless you preach the gospel along with digging the well. The great disappointment when World Vision went the way they did a few years ago was not that they weren't feeding the poor. No. The great disappointment was that they used to give the gospel along with feeding the poor. And can I paraphrase what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What does it profit a person to go to bed with a full belly if they wake up in hell? And that's what Jesus is saying. He is not saying that we shouldn't do works of charity. He is not saying that we shouldn't give to the poor, that we shouldn't care for those who are in need. But he is saying that the greatest need that every human being has is to hear the gospel. And yes, we as the church, we have fed the bellies so that the bellies don't grumble as they hear the gospel. We have built the hospitals so that the person can be healed physically, so they can hear the gospel and be healed spiritually. But Jesus says, you as the crowd, you've got it backwards. You're here only for the physical. And I'm here all about the spiritual. Well, this crowd is feisty. That unlike some of the people that Jesus deals with, they don't go quietly. And they come back to him and say, verse 28, they push back. They say, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Wow. Again, the wrong question. Right? Go back to verse 27. Look what, what Jesus says. Do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will, what's the word? Give you. Give you. Does this, is there a work you can do that the Son of Man is obligated to give you eternal life? No. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Scripture tells us that abundantly clearly, that it is, it is not by works, and yet the crowd is still in the mentality of, of, of the Pharisees of the day, and that is that you get in good with God by what you do. And they say to him, okay, what do we need to do? Now, let's be honest here, folks. They really are still not about the eternal life. They're about him agreeing to be their king so that he can feed them every day. And they say to him, okay, well, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? And that's the way all religion is in this world. You know, there, there is not a religion that does not have that as its main mantra. Oh, they may give you a total list. If, if you go to Judaism versus Hinduism, that it'll be a completely different list of what you have to do. But it's all about what you do. And Jesus says, whoa, this isn't about the works that you're doing. This is the work of God, that you might believe in him whom he has sent. What does he say? What, what do we have to do? This is like the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, what do I need to do to eternal life? Keep all the laws and commandments. Arrogant, arrogant sucker says, I've done it since I was a little boy. And Jesus says, well, one thing, and he lays his finger on what the man's priority was, says, sell all you have and give it away to the poor. That's not how you get into heaven, is it? It's not by selling everything you have and giving to the poor, that you get into heaven. That was the thing that was hindering the young man from getting into heaven because he loved his money more than he loved who? Jesus. And Jesus says, here is the work. And it's not a work. It's not something you can do with your hands. It's not something you can, you can give in the offering plate. It's not something that you can serve in the local church. It's believe in the one whom the Father has sent. Who is the one the Father has sent? Jesus. Well, lest you think these, this crowd is a pushover, 
they come back again. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you? How do you feel about them asking that question? Yes, they just got fed the day before. Okay, we, there's not 5,000 of us here tonight. But if Jesus came down here at the front and he had five little buns and a couple of little fish, and he divided it up so that all of us here this evening would have our bellies filled, that we, we had more than enough to eat, and then there were leftovers from the, the five buns and the two fish. Would it not be an amazing miracle, even with this number of people? But now, multiply that to probably between fifteen and 20,000 people that Jesus does this miracle for. And the nerve of the people who are wanting to make him king because he can provide them bread is... Well, okay, we'll believe in you if you give us a sign. And they, they're willing even to, to give him an illustration. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So do you get what they just said to Jesus? Yesterday was great. But if you want to impress us, and do a sign that we will believe you are the one sent from God, you provide bread for us for 40 years. Because that's how long the manna lasted, right? That when they left Egypt, they were hungry, and they got, Moses prays to God, and, and Mo, God says, okay, in the morning, every day, every six days, there's going to be this dew on the ground, and when the dew lifts, there's going to be this white uh, wafer, uh, coriander wafer looking thing that is going to taste of honey. And for 40 years, every uh, Sunday to Saturday, or Sunday to Friday, every morning they get up, there is manna on the ground. I love it. Do you, do you, know, what, do you know why it's called manna? Manna is the Hebrew words for what is it? So for 40 years, they ate, what is it? And he gave them quail at night, but they, they just go on the manna. Okay, Moses provided manna in the, the, the wilderness for 40 years, so if you feed us for 40 years, that's a good enough sign. What's a good enough sign to make someone believe? There isn't one. Do you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man and Lazarus the beggar. And the rich man dies and goes to hell. And Lazarus dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man tries to call out from hell and say, you know, listen, just... Let Lazarus dip his finger in the water and touch my tongue because it would give me relief from what I'm experiencing. And Abraham says there's a great gulf between you and, and us and, and nobody can pass over it to you. He says, then what's his next thing? Then he thinks of his brothers. I have five brothers. Send Lazarus back from the dead. And if Lazarus, surely if one comes from the dead, that my brothers will believe and they will avoid the fate that I have, am experiencing. And the answer he's given is what? No, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even though one returns from the dead. Our world has this mentality. You know, oh, we... People would just believe in Jesus if we did a big enough miracle. Jesus did enough big miracles. And the problem isn't the lack of a sign. The problem is in the hardness of the human heart. Remember the parable of the soils? 
that a sower went forth to sow and he casts a seed. And, and there are four kinds of soil that Jesus tells us. And he tells us that first is the, the hard, the soil that's been trampled, the pathway. And that it falls there and it can't get a hold because the ground is, is not worked and it's hard. And Satan comes and snatches away the seed so that it cannot take root. Do you know how many churches in the 80s and the 90s decided that the problem was with the sower and with the seed and we had to change our message and our methodologies and all of these things to reach more people? And the whole point of this parable is not the sower or the seed. It's the human hearts. And these people, though they say that they would believe. Do you remember the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders cried out to Jesus on the cross, come down that we may believe on you. Three days later, he did a much greater miracle than coming down off the cross. He rose from the grave. What did they do about that? They paid off the guards who witnessed it. And created the lie that his, his disciples had come and stolen the body. The one who was risen from the dead, yet will they not believe. And Jesus hits them right between the eyes again. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. But my father... Gives you the true bread from heaven. Moses was just a messenger boy. Moses took the people's complaint that they were hungry to God. He prayed to God. God responded to Moses. And he told, he told Moses not to do anything. Except tell the people tomorrow morning when they wake up. There will be this stuff on the ground. Collect it and eat it. You know you might say that, that you know. When Moses hit the rock and water came forth from the rock that Moses did something. But when it comes to manna, it wasn't Moses who provided manna. It was God. And here Jesus makes a transition from the physical bread of the day before and the manna bread of the, the Egyptian uh, uh, exodus and he turns to a spiritual meaning. And he says, listen, it was my father, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, and my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. What's he just done? He has turned the conversation from Five little loaves from the day before. And the physical stuff of manna. To say that the real bread that God has given is a person. The person who has come down from heaven. And that is Jesus. And they say, give us this always. They still are thinking of physical food. You know, it's amazing that in the book of John, we have two stories that are parallel. Now, before you think I'm talking about chapter 5, I'm actually talking about chapter 4. Do you remember on that occasion, Jesus was sitting by a well in Samaria? And a woman comes along and he says, give me something to drink. And the woman says, hey, what are you doing talking to me? I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. I'm a, you're, you're a man, I'm a woman. We shouldn't be talking to one another. And you don't have anything to, to dip into the well to get something to drink. So, tough. And Jesus comes back to her and says, if you knew who you were talking about, you would ask me for living water and you would never thirst again. Now, he wasn't talking about water like was down in Jacob's well, was he? He was talking about himself. And what happened on that occasion? How did it end up with that woman? She too responded, give me this that I never have to come here to draw water again. But how did it finish with that Samaritan woman? Okay, let me ask you it this way. Who thinks we're going to see the Samaritan woman in heaven? 
Amen. Amen. Who thinks we're going to see the multitude who got the loaves and the fishes in heaven? Some of them, maybe a few of them, but not most of them. Because they were purely involved in, in the things of this. And it, we're going to finish with this now. But if you jump down to the end of the chapter and the consequence of what we're talking about, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? That Jesus says some hard things in this passage because he is the bread of heaven. He says, listen, don't be after the five loaves to be multiplied. The hope is not in a Messiah who gives you multiplied loaves every day. The hope is in the Messiah who is the bread of life. Let me ask you this as we conclude. What does bread represent in that society? I almost did it, but I, I decided not to. I was going to bring a potato up here tonight. Because in my culture, among my people, a potato is the equivalent of bread. Brother Andy, he's Italian. If he had brought his equivalent, he would have brought pasta. Some of you who grew up with rice, you would have brought rice. Why? Because bread, bread is the, the basic necessity to keep life together. It is the food to keep you alive. Look at what happened in Ireland when we had the potato blight. And how many, almost a million people, they figured, died of starvation. In Italy, pasta. Why? Because it's cheap and it's filling. Rice, because it's cheap and it's filling. And Jesus says, hey, I am the bread of life. What does that say? I am the absolute necessity for your spiritual existence. This morning we said our hope is in the return of Jesus Christ. My friends, our hope is in a person, and his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you the glory. And we thank you, Father, that we have understood the picture that Jesus makes that he is the necessity. It's not physical bread that we desperately need. It is spiritual life through the living bread, the one who has come from heaven that we need. And Father, help us to share that with this world in which we live. Everybody's chasing a dollar. But what happens when we get to the end of this life? And we can't take our dollars with us. There's only one who's sufficient then. And praise you, Father, his name is Jesus. And he is our Savior. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Well, Jesus, the Son of Man and the Son of God with so many names. <clears throat> And uh, he's the bread of life. And we're going to sing a song. You'll know it when we just stand together. His name is wonderful. Goes through some of those names as well. And we can also reflect on what we learned tonight is him being the bread of life. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Love.
Claim that wonderful name in our homes, in our communities, our schools, our workplace, wherever we find it today and tomorrow and as the week progresses and hopefully to see you again next week. God bless you.